So welcome back to our ESMD statistical review training. We are now on lecture four of this series. And for today's lecture, I have a special guest here entirely voluntarily. This guest is Justin Thompson. He is going to present the audience viewpoint from this class, or should I say the participant viewpoint. Usually when I get to this part of the lecture, it's after lunch, people have had their coffee, people are excited, people are enthused because we've been covering all this great material and they're feeling very empowered. And often people are feeling very critical. And I wanted to have the critics perspective at this lecture. So I looked for the best possible representation I could in my house of what a typical class would be. And I found Justin Samuel Thompson. So without any further ado, let's go ahead and get started with today's lecture. Okay, so just in case you didn't know where you are, you are at ESMD Statistical Review Training. We are on lesson four, not lesson three of the statistical review requirements. The material was prepared by myself and Justin Nguyen and our special guest star is Justin Thompson. In the next couple of lectures, we're gonna talk about one of my favorite and least favorite topics, and that is statistical testing. The quality standards require that you do statistical testing to support comparison statements, whether expressed directly or indirectly. Um, we don't have time to get into my feelings on indirect comparisons today, but I can assure you that we will in the next lecture. And also comparison statements, such as historical comparisons are appropriate. This is going to be material cover that you'll need to cover to complete checklist items 12 and 13 in our statistical review. And there's a lot to cover, so let's get started. Actually, all we're gonna cover in this lecture is graphs. So I said we wanted to cover the material we needed to complete statistical review or checklist 12 and 13. I lied. Today, we're just gonna go over item 13. We'll be talking about graphs. So what are you looking for? Well, you're looking for obvious errors. And before you shake your head and says, nobody will give me a graph with an obvious error, you better believe they will. It happens all the time. And I bet you everybody watching this lecture has done it at least once. Obvious errors are the things that is easiest to catch. You might get a lot of resistance when you're actually correcting them. People tend to get a little bit sensitive, but that's okay. We wanna correct those obvious errors before they go out the door. Then you're gonna start looking about the quality of the graphs and figures themselves. You want the right dimensions for the graphs and figures for the data. This is often easier seen through example than explained with a bunch of words. And so we'll go through a few examples. Stensis Bureau standard, with every graph that you put out there, you have to list the source of the data and you really have to list the periods of data that are um, contained in the graph. Why is this important? It's important because once you put a information product out there, anybody can cut and paste that information product and they can cut those graphs and take them out of context completely. So if you don't have a caption that has this clear labeling and says where the data are from, you could find this graph that's perfectly fine in your paper, misrepresenting the Census Bureau elsewhere. So we try to protect against this by including all this information in the captions. Finally, if your graph includes a survey statistic and you are making comparisons with the graph, you're gonna to wanna to discuss margins of error as appropriate. Now, this is not necessarily going to be a hard and fast rule, but it is a rule. And we will talk about that again. We'll talk about that today. And we'll also talk about it in lecture five when I'm gonna talk a little bit about time series. Um, that's gonna be one of the few exceptions we have where you're gonna look at graphs of seasonally adjusted estimates and you're not gonna require margins of error. But for today, let's just throw that aside out, put a pin in it and save it for future reference. Okay, so Justin, are you ready for um, some examples? You better believe I'm ready. I'm so glad. Oh, I lied, Justin. I wanna talk about the quality standards for margins of error. So just hold on, hang on to all this excitement, okay? All right. All right. Statistical requirement, and I'm going to move our beautiful pictures up here so you can see them, says that key estimates in the text must be accompanied by confidence intervals or margins of error 
or their equivalents. And by equivalents, I mean for Bayesian inferences or for error arising from synthetic data. Now, this says in the text, and you could say, well, Jenny, you're talking about graphs or figures. And that is true. But you have to remember, whatever you're saying in the text is going to have to be supported by the graph or figure if you happen to put that figure in there. So maybe I should have said it the other way. If you have a figure and you're going to use that to make a point, it's got to be supported in the text. If it's in the text, it has to have a margin of error. It's just something to think about. The other thing that's really important is the standards are unequivocal on this. You can't just say all of these estimates are point estimates. Check out this URL to get your measures of statistical uncertainty. That's not sufficient. If you're telling a story, you have to tell the complete story. Why do you think it would be so important to include a margin of error around a plot of estimates? Any idea, Justin? No, I can't think of any off the top of my head. All right, let me ask you a different question. Um, and this, of course, is presupposing that you've had any statistics classes. And that is, what's the probability that your estimate, which is a random variable, is correct? I can't say for certain. Yes, you can. The probability that a point estimate is correct is zero. There is no chance that a random variable is the truth. You have to provide a measure of uncertainty. That's from Stats 101, which I don't believe you took, did you? Nevertheless, everybody else taking this training has. So what questions are you gonna ask when you're reviewing a graph? I bet you can't wait to find out, can you, Justin? No, I cannot. I didn't think you could. First of all, going back to this, are there obvious errors? If there are obvious errors, you're pretty much done. You say, this graph has an obvious error, you have to correct it, and then I can review it. Is the graph appropriate for the data? That makes sense, right? Is the combination of data in the graph meaningful? And this actually is gonna be beyond what I'm gonna show you today, but I do wanna talk about it for a minute. There is a bit of a trend to combine different data products into one graph to show you a story. And that can be fine, but if you're going to do that, you need to think, are these different sources measuring the same units or kind of units? Are they conveying information from the same time period? Are there big conceptual differences between these two sources of data? If you can answer yes to that last one, or the time periods are different, or the units are vastly different, you shouldn't be putting them together. You're not telling a meaningful story. Anything that's in that graph now that looks similar is just a coincidence. And we don't want that out there. And the last question is, is the graph conveying the true story? And I'm putting that in a different font and I'm putting quotes on it because we don't know what the true story is. So really what this should be saying is, is the graph conveying the story that you're trying to tell in a way with statistical integrity that is meaningful and easy to understand. Do you need a PhD to understand the graph? Because if you do, it's not a meaningful graph. We would like our graphs to be simple and interpretable and straight to the point. All right, so let's go through some examples. Let's start with this example. We've got a bar chart. We have three different sources of expenditure and we're looking at percentage of expenditures by method. Anybody see anything wrong with this graph? Not that I can tell. Really? Yeah. How about now? Uh, uh, you, you, that's not, I'm not seeing any percentages on your Y the axis. There aren't. If this is percentages of expenditures, why are we going up to 1,200? Can you? It's me. Yeah, you can't review this graph. It's obviously wrong. Either the title is wrong or the Y axis is wrong. They have to correct that. And so we had them correct that. Same graph, just a different y-axis, much better, right? Right. Well, at least it makes sense. Now, you can look at this graph and you may say to yourself, I like this graph. I can make some obvious comparisons just looking at this. And so it's telling me a really great story. You know, it's telling me for whatever reason and method, see, I, I use mostly cash. 
Whereas with method B, I don't. Okay, that's valid. If this is the story that you wanna tell or you wanna do a little bit of work, that's fine. Alternatively, you could tell the story this way. You could use stacked bar charts. Now, one thing I wanna bring up here is you'll notice when I put together the stack bar chart, I include the percentages corresponding to the different colors. Do you think this would be as a graph that's as easy to interpret or tell the same story if I didn't include the percentages? I don't think so. Just for like example, if you were to compare method A and method C in cash, without like the percentage values, those pictures look awfully similar. Exactly. This is one of those cases where the bar chart might look prettier and you might think by eyeballing it, you would be just fine, but you really need to include those percentages. Great catch, Justin. Okay. So that was a graph that was obviously wrong. We saw it, we made them fix it. And then we said, well, you could display it in a different way. And I'd like you to think about that different way because it might come in handy when you're reviewing your sample paper. But let's put that, put a pin in it and shove that aside for a minute. I wanna talk about misleading graphs, which is otherwise known as one great method of lying with statistics. Where would you find a misleading graph? Well. You might see it in your axis labeling and scaling errors. You, you know, your axis is either exaggerating or hiding change. Um, you might find missing margins of error, which would lead to false unsupported contrasts. And again, and we've already talked about this, you might find inappropriate combinations of data sources. All right, so I've got two graphs here, same thing, both interest rates. Um, going from the years 2008 to 2012, which of these graphs do you think is misleading, Justin? Definitely that left one. It really is misleading, isn't it? Look at the scale on this y-axis. For all intents and purposes, you're talking differences in 0 0.001. If you were to see this graph on the left and you weren't looking at the y-axis, you would think there'd be a huge increase in interest rates since 2008, wouldn't you? That I would. But that's not the real story, is it? Okay, let's look at this one. This is the average home price in Suitland, Maryland from a sample survey, unnamed and possibly fictional. Justin, do you see anything wrong with this graph? No, I'm um, just looking at it. Can't see anything wrong with it. If you look at this graph and what conclusion would you come to? I would see that the average home price in Suitland, at least as of 2015, has risen since 2014. Good, wouldn't you? Yeah. Yeah. And you know what that is? That is misleading because this is a sample survey and these are point estimates and the probability that these estimates are correct is zero. These graphs do not convey any measure of statistical uncertainty, no error. And that is wrong when we have a sample survey. Let's go in and add 90% confidence limits. When we add these error bars to the graph, you can see very clearly that in fact, we cannot tell whether there was a change or not because the error bars overlap. These 90% confidence error limits overlap each other. There's no evidence of a statistical difference. This graph is misleading. This graph is a lie. They need to drop it. And as a reviewer, I'm going to tell them that. And if you come back to me and say to me, well, my graph didn't have 90% confidence limits, I'm going to say to you, well, it should have. The quality standards are pretty clear on this. And this is a misleading graph. Okay, let's move on. So here's another example. This is a graph of Maryland football wins for 16 years. What do you think of this graph, Justin? I don't like it. Why not? Think, you don't like Maryland? You think they're a losing team? Well, I mean, everyone knows that, but I really don't like uh, the y-axis. Um, it seems to imply that they play 100 games a year be a lot for a college football team, wouldn't it? This is a y-axis that is just not consistent with the data. 
And as a result, it's extremely misleading because it really looks like this is an awfully consistent football team, doesn't it? It does. Yeah. So let's plot it on a more realistic y-axis. Very different story, isn't it? Yeah. Which might explain why Durkin started as head coach in 2015. Now, it doesn't explain why he was fired in 2018, but that's a different and much sadder story. All right, one more example because examples are so much fun. I'm giving everybody a chance to look at this. This is the most dangerous cities in 2018. It's a census. It's coming from Jenny's fictional homicide register. And we're gonna look at the most dangerous cities in 2018 by total number of murders. So keep remember this, it's Chicago, New York, Detroit, LA, and Philadelphia. What do you think of this graph, Justin? I uh, mean, you know, on the surface, it seems fine, but the last I checked, New York City was way bigger than Chicago as a city. So I don't think this graph is taking into account the sizes of, of the cities. And you are exactly right. This is incredibly misleading. We need to do something on a per capita basis, don't we? So let's. Uh-oh, we did. And look at that. All of our cities have changed. Although I believe St. Louis was in the graph before. I can't remember. And it's still there. I don't understand that being from St. Louis and not being dead myself. But I wasn't in St. Louis in 2018. So that could explain it. All right. So good catch, Justin. This is a very different story. Very misleading, especially, you know, if you don't have a vendetta against New York. Now, I wanna make one more comment before I move on, and I'll talk about this a little bit more in the next lecture. This graph is using census data, so we don't have to worry about sampling error or margin of error. Comparing ranked estimates is much trickier with sample survey data, because in the sample survey, every estimate is gonna be surrounded by some kind of margin of error, and ranking is gonna be trickier with estimates that overlap. But in this particular case, my fictional homicide re register is a census, so we don't have to worry about that. Now, we've seen a lot of bar charts in this lecture. I think you can agree, Justin, that pretty much all I've shown everybody are bar charts today. Yeah. Well, no, that's not really true. I did show you that line chart of, of um, Maryland football wins, but are you tired of bar charts? Absolutely. I thought you might be. I mean, let's be honest here. Bar charts are so simple and clear cut and boring, you know, and they always have to start at zero, which is just really depressing. Maybe you want to do something sexier like this. What do you think? Does it tell the same story? <laughs> no. Well, it's certainly more exciting. I don't know what Detroit stands for. How he even compares to New Orleans and New York, which look, whose bosses look, look kind of similar in size to say St. Louis or Baltimore, but without any labeled X or Y axes or percentages. The most I can tell from this colored graph, which has Detroit and Baltimore similar, having a similar color, is these are the most dangerous cities in 2018. Yeah, this is one of those examples where you have an easy, sexy looking graphical package that seems like it might be presenting a story in an innovative and new way. But when you actually analyze the graph, you discover there's not a lot there that you can use for analysis. And as a statistical reviewer, this graph would be really and truly unacceptable because there's no way to validate the story if there's a story to be told and it's not really clear. So while you might be really tempted to put together something like this, when you do, you're gonna to have to either provide a really long caption explaining the story told, or, well, that's pretty much it. And that caption is gonna be subject to a scrutiny as well. So I always like to bring this up as my last example in the graphics lecture because 
for a while, these kind of graphs were really popular among the data visualization gurus. And they were added to every single software package you can imagine that displays data. And people got very enthusiastic about using this new and exciting graphical tool. And it always left me a little bit cold as a reviewer because I wasn't sure what they were showing. And because, you know, I tend to be very entrenched in what I know, I've shown this now to a lot of different classes. And so far, Justin's answer has been pretty typical. His was a little bit longer. Most classes just sit there and go, huh? And I'm not sure if that's because they hate this graph so much or because they're really ready to start exercise four. But you should be. So what I want you to do now that you are armed with all this important knowledge on how to review a graph for a statistical report review, go ahead and look at our sample paper and review figures two through five. And then with your team, complete section 13 of the statistical review form and send it to our training coordinator. So before we do that, I wanna have one more thanks to Justin Thompson for showing up today and making this lecture as exciting as it was. Um, he helped me convey a lot of important messages and it might have been a nice break for those of you who are tired of hearing my voice. So thank you very much, Justin, for your participation today. You're welcome. And thanks class, we've got one more, maybe two, who knows, lecture to go.